It's March 12th, 2020. I'm told to work from home. There's a global pandemic. Things sound pretty bad in Europe, and I'm getting anxious. But the president says this will all blow over by Easter, so I try not to worry. Still, I find myself with a lot of time at home alone. So I do what I assume everyone else does. I clean my room, buy a VR headset, watch YouTube videos, try learning guitar, play video games, stay up late watching movies, learn to cook, watch more movies, grow a beard, play more video games, and that all lasts me about a week. So I clean my room again, shoot more stuff in VR, give up on guitar, watch more movies, eat 525 York Mints, play more video games, and pull more late nights watching video essays on YouTube before thinking. I should make one of these. And as soon as I began to consider what I could possibly tackle in a mediocre YouTube video that most people wouldn't find, let alone sit through, it hit me. I hope 2020 is the year video essays on little women become the big thing on YouTube. Got enough ones about Marvel movies. Okay. Clear sign from God received, I grabbed my notebook, shaved my beard, and consumed every version of little women I could get my hands on. And I probably would have landed on Little Women anyway. Being the least socially distanced movie of all time, Greta Gerwig's 2019 adaptation of the 1868 classic has been my go-to comfort eye food during these dark times. It's bright and beautiful, yet grounded by relatable hardships. The March family radiates charisma and wholesome fun. I'm feeling the dern. And Laura's performance as Marmy ranks just below Diana Moran and just above Tammy Taylor on the world's greatest mom scale. All that being said, I, I decided to make a video about little women. I don't have any grand contrarian thesis or particularly warm take, but if there are a few things I hope to convey, they would be one, I love this story. Two, the 2019 adaptation is the best version of this story, and three, Greta Gerwig deserved the Oscar nom, which will become clear when we examine a few key directorial decisions and innovative screenwriting techniques. Her calculated approach to language, dialogue, pacing, multilinear storytelling, color grading, and a more perfect ending than it may appear to be on the surface provides scientific certainty of her nominational worthiness, and also happen to be features which elevate 2019 to the top of the adaptation list and make me love it. Now I'm no film critic or established YouTube guy, so before you tell me to eat shit and die in the comments, remember, I'm just a mortal man talking about a movie he really likes. And maybe go watch this film so we can warm your cold dead heart. I've been in love with this movie since I first saw it four times in theaters with my mom, my ex-girlfriend, and two different guys named Noah. It was my second favorite of all 61 movies I saw in 2019. And now I know you're all probably wondering what was number one. Uh, you're probably thinking of this one. Hipsters thought of this one. Real hipsters thought of this one. But correct and informed individuals such as myself thought of... Hey! Remember what I told you about the comments? <sighs> Of course I want to talk about Little Women, a film so cozy and inviting, thoughtfully crafted by someone so in love with the source material, featuring top tier performances and all surrounded by such interesting romantic geometry. It gets better with every rewatch and I can't help but miss these characters as soon as the credits roll. It may sound kind of cheesy, but Joe March made writing seem cool to me, inspiring me to stay up writing the script for this video which is far from as candid as I'm trying to make it appear. Between her and Hamilton, writing has seemed pretty badass lately, and there are far more destructive habits I could have got into during quarantine than writing and video editing. But before getting ahead of ourselves, we should at least acknowledge the plot of these works. If the title and timestamp didn't deter you from making it this far, odds are you know this already, but let's hit the high points. There's some women, they're little, they're sisters, 
They all have different dreams and flaws and life hits them like a bus hitting Rachel McAdams as they try to figure out who they are, what they value, and how the hell they're supposed to get by as a woman in the 1860s. Meg is honest, caring, and true to her heart, especially when the poor handsome neighbor fractures her resolve to marry a wealthy man as society prescribes to her. Joe is brave, independent, and dreams of being a literary spinster with a pen for a spouse. Amy is unfiltered, practical, envious, and dreams of being a famous artist until she realizes she can't be much of anything without marrying a rich man. Beth is quiet, pure, and selfless, and just wants her family to be close, often characterized as the best of us. The 1933 film was solid, but vibes like you might imagine an old black and white movie about an 1860s family to vibe. Katherine Hepburn steals the show and makes the rest of the cast look like plastic. She also does all sorts of rad parkour because Joe March is athletic and rowdy and stuff. Despite the addition of color, 1949's adaptation struck me as duller and more bland than its predecessor. I suspect the missing ingredient was Katherine Hepburn, but it might have been the fact that it was the second 70-year-old Little Women adaptation I watched in two days. June Allison still does some parkour, but much like her performance, she's not quite on Hepburn's level. Both films spend far less time on sisters' career ambitions and paint them as more romantically focused than their modern counterparts. 1994 is the classic everyone grew up with and loves. Except for me, because I just watched it this year. It's good, I get it, clearly an improvement as one would expect with the time difference, more focus on Joe's writing than older adaptations, and Kirsten Dunst is cute as hell. Oh, and Winona Ryder does zero parkour. The 2017 BBC series is like if Greta Gerwig made a movie three times as long with lesser known actors and forgot to write any jokes. You'd recognize Maya Hawke from Stranger Things. Her performance is fine, but I hated it as soon as I found out the guy who plays Steve wasn't cast as Laurie. The 2018 modern remake is a fun idea, but executed pretty poorly. It's neat to see all the modern equivalents of period specific story beats. It's just unfortunate that the modern equivalent of Joe March appears to be a condescending person who's impossible to root for. The anime is a thing that exists and makes the brave creative choice to open each episode with Mr. March just spanking the hell out of his youngest. I watched all 48 episodes, including one where the primary focus is Beth introducing a stray cat to all her different dolls, which made me question what I was doing with my life, but I soldiered on. It's half Little Women and half historical kids show. I like it because this is the closest Joe March comes to actually fighting Confederate soldiers. And all of these would be nothing without Louisa May Alcott's book as the inspirational masterpiece. There's a reason why we're still telling this story in different ways 150 years later. Gerwig's latest empathy machine celebrates the spirit of the original while extrapolating themes from the novel and creating something all her own. She sprints heart first into her period drama debut, spectacularly showcasing the relationships which have tugged on audiences' heartstrings for generations, while adding calculated updates Alcott would be proud of. Joe March does exactly one parkour move here, but plenty of emotional Kong vaults and precisions throughout the film. Sure, the 20 years of cinematic progress from 1994 to now shows loud and clear, but the writing and performances are what really won me over. But before we put filmmaking decisions under the microscope, I just want to yell about why I love this movie. Most of these things come from the source material, so all credit to Alcott, but Gerwig and her cast galvanize a lot of the story beats that resonate with me in an innovative way. The story flat out rocks. I adore these characters, hopes, dreams, baggage, and flaws. The movie puts them all on display and just paints the screen with humanity. It's such a tangled family whose problems have unclear or dissonant solutions evolving over the course of the film. Just like Lady Bird, every character feels interesting enough to have their own movie. Each girl has their own unique magnetic pool, and as I watch the family, I just wish I was living life with them. Alcott weaves such a complicated web of messy love stories, and Gerwig's cast commitment stops just short of reaching through the screen, grabbing your heart, and manually pumping blood into your body. I'm no stranger to hopeless romanticism, or even losing family I love to bullshit illness, and the helpless feeling accompanying each. This movie was chopping all the right onions for me. It's the kind of film that'll make you want to call your parents on the way home from the theater. It feels like Gerwig stole the script from the perfect Hallmark movie and smashed it together with the cast list from the next A24 Oscar nom. 
I was watching Chopped with my mom last night, and Judge Manit Chuan described a contestant's mac and cheese as lush, harmonious comfort food. Which I'm pretty sure would have been Roger Ebert's exact review of this movie had he been alive to see it. This heartfelt roller coaster has more life packed into two hours than you could possibly experience even if you were allowed outside your house right now. To put it succinctly, Little Women is a fucking banger. We'll take this. Gerwig infuses an incredible pace and energy into the historical period piece genre that is often stereotyped as slow and boring. She achieves a more irreverent and lightweight tempo compared to other period dramas or even other adaptations of the same story. Like most movies, it's heavily scripted, but the performances and lines have just enough chaos to make you wonder if it's improvised. We cut through every slice of life and most of us find someone to relate to between the four sisters with juxtaposed goals. The film opens with a deep breath and then just goes for two hours, hustling through 700 pages of source material covering 10 years, 8 plot lines, and 4 seasons. Gerwig said it like this, I didn't want anything to feel anachronistic. I wanted it to feel like it was moving at the speed of life. The pace achieved across this film felt like a whimsical porch dance with Timothy Chalamet. It's impressive both for the sheer volume of content Gerwig manages to cram into just over two hours, and how brilliantly she leverages the film's speed to inject a specific energy into her environments. Not a frame is wasted in this whirlwind of a story covering so much life for so many characters. Scenes are often an entropy of multiple voices colliding and bouncing off each other's words and actions, which helps pack characterization into the film like Joe March packs a suitcase. These skirts are huge, where do they fit? Did Emma Watson cast an undetectable extension charm? Come on. <laughs> the, the interesting device she uses to achieve this are these fun little slashes she drops all across the screenplay. In the preface of the screenplay, a note reads, Where there is simultaneous or quick dialogue in the script, there is a slash in the middle of the speaker's dialogue, representing where the next actor should begin. The following actor's line will be started with a slash to indicate that it is interrupting another line. A clever technique for shrinking the space between every moment in the film, while making conversations feel more natural than you might expect from a typical 1800s period drama. Sure, we can attribute the natural feeling of conversation to the all-star cast of actors, but these slashes highlight how surgical Greta was with her intentions, even adding slashes in the middle of words at times. The impact of this maneuver is a stream of energized conversations that also convey a sense of intimacy. As the characters seem to already know how the other's thought will resolve, and choose not to waste further time before weighing in. It feels more exciting for the characters, and I'm more excited as a viewer. Going back to previous adaptations after watching these conversations kind of feels like listening to podcasts at normal speed after you've grown accustomed to 1.3 speed with the Remove Silences feature turned on. Shout out Pocket Casts. The viewer can pick which frequency to tune into in these chaotic scenes. The first scene with everyone in the Lawrence household hosts several different conversations happening all at once, colliding in what Gerwig describes as a controlled cacophony. New lines are starting before others finish, and the room is flooded with life and energy. This paints a picture of how bright and impactful the March family shines on the cold and hollow Lawrence household. We get rapid glances of characterization and stage setting as the camera spins around the Lawrence study like it's Eric Foreman's basement. We establish or enforce the following. Meg's motherly instinct as she rushes to care for Amy. Joe's intellectual instinct as she rushes to check out Lori's dope book collection. Lori's instinct to check out Joe. Brooke's infatuation with Meg. Amy's juvenile audacity. Joe's bluntness. Mr. Lawrence isn't as mean as you might suspect. Mari will be your mom, Lori, since you don't have one. Brooke's a huge nerd, and the two households newly established alliance. Overall, every sister has their interests shine through, rounding out their character without devoting a scene to each of them. Even Beth's music gets a shout out and she's not here, which I guess further establishes her as the shy character who loves her home. Remember, we've got 700 pages to cover, so let's make every scene count. And as we exit the scene, depending on what frequency you're tuned into, you probably miss one of my favorite Amy moments as she asks Mr. Lawrence, whom she just met, to order her a painting, because there are multiple other voices still talking and Joe's is mixed the loudest. 
It's subtle, but instead of teaching the audience about her characters by giving them a solo, Gerwig reveals their affections together in a playful symphony. The absence of this controlled cacophony can be just as powerful as the spectacle of its presence. I love the few seconds of Laurie, Brooke, and Mr. Lawrence in stunned, awkward silence after the March crew rolls out. Every scene in the Lawrence house without the girls is dull and lifeless. Laurie is literally looking out a window in each one of them, just waiting for somebody to rescue him from this prison he's in. It's like he's in detention. Perhaps you could tutor my grandson in manners as well as mathematics. While this highlights a clever way to write conversation, the on-screen fireworks show certainly isn't exclusive to speaking, and we don't lose this sensation when the dialogue drops out. Just look at the porch scene! It's pure movie magic and not a word is spoken. Joe and Laurie escape the party for a fairy tale of a first date in what is one of my favorite scenes in the film. It's propaganda for a lifestyle of leaning in that I want to subscribe to. If you're not into the porch dance, you probably keep your hands down on roller coasters and think Fast and Furious movies are dumb. This clinic of fun dwarfed every subsequent version I watched in the other adaptations, especially 2018, which I might characterize as movie cyanide. And I know I shouldn't dunk on Lori for dancing or dressing, like nobody's watching, but when you give him a fedora, a Range Rover, and a habit for playing the acoustic guitar in front of people he's just met, I stop rooting for him pretty quickly. Anyway, back to the porch. Just look how smitten Laurie is. Tonight he's met Joe March, and I don't know that he matches this level of joy for the rest of the movie. He's just fun to watch in this. Chalamet's physical acting throughout the film is... Chef's Kiss. Gerwig said this scene was the most fun to shoot, and now I know why. And while we're talking pace and storytelling strategies, can we talk about the time jumps? This was my first experience with the story, and I assumed the original was told in time jumps too, because it's done so well and so precisely. I think this is the real master stroke that sets Gerwig's adaptation apart from the others. We have two different origin points, set seven years apart, that both only move forward. If you prefer to visualize your timelines in terms of Nolan films, this best matches the Dunkirk approach. The flashbacks provide past context to everything happening in the present timeline. Scenes from the past are color graded with a warmer, vibrant yellow tint, while the future timeline dons a colder, bluish hue. Throughout the movie, Gerwig transitions from one timeline to the other, with scenes directly mirroring or sharply contrasting one another. The story beautifully weaves between the two timelines, with each scene in one timeline setting the stage for the next scene in the other. Once we learn Joe tells her life story in the novel, the past timeline can serve as a stand-in for this novel, bringing what actually is reality into question, which is more interesting and kind of just how memories work. But why is this cool? What does this do for the film and what does this do for us? In addition to providing context of the past moments that influence the characters' current lives, the past scenes build up masses of potential energy that can be realized in their present counterparts. The time jumps really highlight the dichotomy between the past and present lives of some of the girls. For example, when we cut from this to this, the pain that Meg is feeling in this scene is amplified by the feeling that life was just so easy and carefree a few frames ago. The present scene feels much colder and lonely in comparison, while reminding us how events in our past influence who we are and what we value. So when Beth dies, oh yeah, Beth dies, and we cut to her having the time of her life at Meg's wedding, it compounds the pain of loss we just experienced. If you've lost someone, you've probably caught yourself saying, oh, but they were just here. Like, you see something that reminds you of that person and you want to tell them, but then there's that microsecond delay before you realize the hard truth that you can't. But they were just here. That oh, but they were just here sting is what I think Gerwig captures so perfectly in this moment by brutally sandwiching Beth's death between two of the brightest family celebrations in the film, highlighting how crippling her absence is and how precious her memories are. And I'm sorry if I'm burying the lead here, but Beth's death is a beautifully executed scene. Tragic, but beautiful. And maybe the biggest example of emotional whiplash the time jumps subject the audience to. As both scenes are blocked and edited identically, yet yield opposite conclusions. In the fairy tale glow of the past, we get a happy resolution, as everything works out the way we hoped it would. 
As we return to reality, with a cut to the darker, cooler color grading of the future, we are punched deep in the gut with a brutal reminder of how things in life don't always go the way we wish. This speaks volumes for the film. In the hopeful tinted scenes, we hear the girls proclaiming their lofty, naive idealizations only to see these bright ambitions are often snuffed out in the future. Flashback scenes are often contained to the cozy March household Gerwig describes as an egalitarian utopia, while future scenes tend to brave the unforgiving, disproportionate outside world. I like my heroes to bleed a bit, which most would agree makes for a more interesting character. And none of these girls make it to adulthood unscathed by the realities of life, especially life for a woman in 1860. Life is hard and families are complicated. This might be the easiest truth to relate to in the film. I never burned my sister's novel while she was at the theater, but I hid the ethernet cord while my brother was at track practice so he couldn't play Halo 2 when he got home, and he kicked the shit out of me. I know the joys of a Christmas reunion, the comfort of seeing old friends. The thrill of wondering if someone has feelings for you, and the sick envy of not being included. I've felt the desperate pain of celebrating remission only to plan a funeral a few months later. This movie scales every peak and valley of life in such a sincere way. I can be wholeheartedly swept up in the energy and emotion of whatever elevation is on the screen throughout. I'm empathizing with characters' struggles and triumphs while reflecting on my own. Huge props to Gerwig, who does an incredible job staying surprisingly true to the dialogue and tone of the book, while expertly rescuing the language from the clutches of 1868, which can sound bland or inhuman to a Twitter zombie millennial like myself. Some of the film's most powerful and surprisingly modern language comes straight from the text. While much of the movie is a one-to-one -one mapping from the novel, Gerwig thoughtfully omits some antiquated language that other renditions include. Shants and shalls become cants and wills. Oh the dickens becomes oh dear. And nobody ever has to hear Mr. Lawrence call Joe a hussy or a sly puss. Gerwig is tactical with her inclusions and diversions, staying true to the book up to the point that it would hold her back or detract from the film's accessibility. And when she does draw her blade and go at the novel like Ben Franklin at his Bible, she elegantly slides in some improvements to replace her cuts. My favorite might be when Joe takes Beth to the beach to get well. Beth says the line, It's like the tide going out. It goes out slowly, but it can't be stopped. Joe's response in the novel is, It shall be stopped. Like we mentioned, shalls and shants don't fly as high in 2019, so we cut it out and are left with, it will be stopped, right? Wrong. We nix the shall, but while we're making changes, Greta sprinkles in a little bit of that Gerwig magic, leaving us with a beautifully defiant, I'll stop it. Because this is Joe March, and what's more Joe March than wanting to fight an ocean? It's a very minor change, but it packs so much more of an oomph and is a testament to how violently she loves people. If I was an ocean, I'd be scared. This arrogant but heartfelt promise only adds to the pain we feel later as Beth dies in front of Joe, despite every ounce of her being willing against it. Gerwig again bends time and space so elegantly at the end of the film, where I would argue she creates the best ending this story has ever seen, which is no easy feat. Most of the criticism and backlash I've seen for any telling of Little Women usually centers around the ending, particularly concerning Joe's fate. The most obvious complaint is Joe not ending up with Laurie, with whom she's built this incredible relationship throughout the last 10 years, only to choose Frederick Bear, who just kinda shows up out of nowhere for the last 20% of the book. Most audiences would have preferred Joe to stay single as she's promised the entire book, unless she were to finally admit some unspoken thing between her and Laurie. Gerwig sought to pay tribute to her idol, Louisa May Alcott, who unenthusiastically allowed her heroine to be married at the pressure of her publisher. If the main character is a girl, make sure she's married by the end. Or dead, either way. Excuse me? But is it really possible to satisfy the audience that didn't want Joe to marry, those who did, and Louisa May Alcott's original intentions? Yes. Kind of. <laughs> through ambiguity. Let's watch Greta go to work here.
At the end of the movie, Joe and her sisters chase down Friedrich at the airport, or a uh, uh, train station, before he leaves for California. The carriage stops, and just as Joe exits the carriage, we cut to our scene standing in for Alcott's actual interaction with a publisher, forcing her to marry Joe March when she had no intention of doing so. Cut back to the train station, and the few seconds of Joe running out of the carriage repeat, only wait, something's different. Roll that back. The color grading has changed to the dreamy yellow tint of the past. And because we've established this tint is our stand-in for the contents of Joe March's novel, rather than reality, we don't actually know that the kiss, the marriage, or anything after this carriage exit actually happens. That's some Inception shit. I see you, Joe, just writing what you needed to satisfy your sexist publisher and get that bread. A clear nod to Alcott making the same decision. Well, I suppose marriage has always been an economic proposition, even in fiction. So because of these clever storytelling techniques, Gerwig manages to explain and honor the original intentions of Louisa May Alcott, stay true to the source material in which Joe marries Bear, and provide just enough leeway to think Joe really ends up single as her and Louisa May Alcott always wanted to be. After we concede the warm colored timeline is merely Joe's novel's account of life, this step out of reality via simple color shift stands in unapologetic defiance to the challenge posed to Joe and all women of the time by extension. And even if we assume that the yellow is simply a flashback but still very much reality, the non-linear storytelling helps make the final partnerships of Joffrey and Lamy feel a bit better by their pairings early on in the film. Gerwig recognizes audiences often believe characters should end up with the first person they're seen on screen with, and consequently opens with scenes from the back half of the book that show Joe dancing with Friedrich and Amy embracing Laurie, setting the stage for a symmetrical ending with each of these pairs. Amy with the rich man she's always adored, and Joe with the first man we've seen who is an intellectual match for her. Still, as thoughtfully as these relationships are resolved, the movie ends with Joe and her true love, her writing. I mentioned how this adaptation is much more focused on the career and ambitions of the March girls, so it's only appropriate that the film closes on Joe March seeing all her tireless work come to fruition. Who does the uh, Oscar noms anyway? Yeesh. <sighs> Say it with me. The 2018 movie actually told the story in time jumps as well, but the even bolder directorial decision from that film was making our protagonist the most unbearable character. And the friend zoning was way worse too. Platonic friends can't ride the same horse like that, Joe. Now that we've settled that, let's kick things over to Professor Mike for our favorite segment, Where's Bobby O? The pinnacle jolly chord in this story is when Mr. March returns home from the warfront to be reunited with his family just in time for Christmas so they can all hug and stuff. One of these films chooses to include Bob Odenkirk in this scene, and it is way more fun. Let's take a look at 1933. Pretty boring, huh? Let's roll it back and have a look. You see... The problem is right here. That's not Bob Odenkirk. And it would be way more fun if it was, right? Roll 94. Get a room, why don't you? Again, we have another flagrant usage of an actor that is not Bob Odenkirk in the role of the March family patriarch. I don't know what they were thinking, but let's compare it with 2019. Boom, immediately, Bob Odenkirk. And notice, Mr. March remains being played by Bob Odenkirk for the remainder of the scene. There he is, and I am so much more happy because of it. Like the March sisters, 
Bob Odenkirk is all I wanted for Christmas, and this movie delivered. Now, I don't care if you're thinking, oh, that's an odd character choice, my immersion was broken, and I, I couldn't stop thinking of Better Call Saul, maybe the greatest spinoff in the history of television. Look how happy Beth is. Back to you, Michael. Thanks, Professor. In all seriousness, Bob Odenkirk was the biggest surprise actor to appear, but I was thrilled with the casting overall. I mean, Saoirse Ronan told Gerwig she should be Joe. How fitting is that? Gerwig makes another tactical diversion from other adaptations by placing a higher focus on the career and status aspirations of the March sisters. Joe's story opens and ends with her writing, and the audience clearly sees it's her most important ambition. I think Alcott would appreciate this focus, as she herself never married and instead focused on her writing career. If we take a look at the numbers, the 2019 adaptation spends 200% more time on Joe's writing than the other films, and this doesn't even take Amy's storyline into account. Another standout achievement for Gerwig's version and one of my favorite character arcs in the story. In all the tellings of Little Women I've consumed, Amy's portrayal saw the most variety. All the sisters, especially those not named Joe, suffer from abridged storylines and character development when you squeeze their lives into a two-hour movie. But Amy's can come off the worst if you highlight her childish misgivings and gloss over her redeeming maturation. Before we continue, we should pause and applaud Florence Pugh for knocking it out of the park as Amy March in her best movie where she wears a flower crown in 2019. She commits wholeheartedly to acting across the toughest age gap, so cumbersome to tackle it's played by two different actors in pretty much every other adaptation. And listen, I know it's going to be tough either way, but I found seeing an entirely different actor more immersion breaking than watching Florence leave it all on the court to come across as two different ages. She doesn't change that much in appearance, but sold me the age difference on her perfect performance alone. From over the top childish, wild and weak, to a powerful, jaded adult. She's overflowing with sporadic emotion as a child, and appears to be barely containing a calculated rage as an adult. It really feels like two different people. Florence's performance is... Chef's Kiss. I can explain. It's not She's playing the character that's easiest to hate, yet I find myself loving her the most, and only fall harder on every rewatch. But I will concede there is one obvious immersion-breaking slip-up here, in that for a character whose most documented vanity is her flawed nose, we cast the actor with the most perfect nose on the face of the planet. But hey, that's Hollywood for you. You know, the book describes Bear as a man without a handsome feature, and look at this hunk. The third time I saw this movie, we were late and rolled in at the start of Amy and Aunt March's carriage ride in France. I was surprised to see how much more it felt like Amy's movie when we opened with her, but maybe I was just paying more attention this time. Either way, I'm thankful Gerwig gave her more time in the spotlight than other adaptations. Except the anime, in which she's actually the narrator. Overall, I think it's easy for Amy to get a bad rap. I think it's strange that she's the only character who's acting consistently honest and rational, and I start disliking her for it. I hate her for acting childish, but she is a child. I think she's weak for wanting to marry Rich, but that was really the only option for a woman at the time. She's just being pragmatic, if not wise. As a man in 2020, I struggle to relate, but there are some lessons in empathy and privilege here, and I'm thankful for Amy for taking me through them. In previous adaptations, Amy's role can feel little more than part of the set, but here we see her start out savage and testy before growing into a beacon of focused resolve and ambition. We see Amy confront the unfortunate realities of the 1860s in France with Laurie, as the two ponder the futures ahead of them. No other Little Women adaptation or any period piece I've seen paints the desperate situation of a woman in this time as clearly and beautifully as Florence Pugh's performance in this scene. Most of us know they couldn't vote and didn't have the same rights as men, but watching Amy spell out how powerless she feels, to the point where a child she carries and births would immediately be the father's property, is next level heartbreaking. This doesn't even come out as explicitly in the book. But Gerwig made a conscious effort to read between the lines of Alcott's novel and pull out messages she expressed in her letters and journals, but was probably discouraged from publishing in her book. Cause you know, sexists. Scenes like Amy in the art room and Joe at the publisher bring out the spirit of Alcott's story. Meryl Streep actually insisted on going further with the art room scene, and after encouraging Gerwig to highlight this desperation, Greta ended up writing this iconic speech on a post-it note hours before filming and then gave it to Florence. How badass is that? That's good. 
So you're not a woman in 1861 and you're having trouble relating or finding something for yourself in this film. Well, first of all, I would say it's always healthy to remember how accepted it was for certain groups of human beings to be oppressed just a few generations ago so that we can remember how easy it might be for the oppression of certain people groups to exist today and go hunting for our blind spots as a society. And if you're looking for something more relatable, then I might point you to the torrents of inescapable heartbreak and hopeless romanticism rolling all across this movie. Because if you're a human being, you've probably had your heart broken in some capacity and can find something to connect with here. This movie is undoubtedly romantic, but every wave of romance is tempered with a large pinch of realism. The romantic threads in this film are so interesting, weaving around each other as the story progresses. I honestly wasn't sure who would end up together, and the misdirection and drama kept my heart on the edge of its seat throughout. Lori and Joe Hill scene is up there with Cap and Thanos Hill scene for me. We didn't have 20 years of MCU movies to add epic weight, but I can feel the years of emotional buildup between these two characters reach its breaking point when we see the spectacular performances by Saoirse and Timothy in this scene. If you don't know what it's like to put it all on Front Street and tell a girl how you really feel, Timmy takes you to that mystical intersection of hopeful and hopeless as he bears his soul to Joe. It's another dance scene, expertly blocked and choreographed, just as beautiful as the one on the porch, and I feel like you aren't sure if they're about to make out or never talk to each other again. It's heartbreaking and low-key hilarious at the same time. I'm convinced Joe is hurting just as much here because both characters care for each other so much. It's just a tragedy they care in different ways. The book details how Joe cares so deeply for Lori, she moves to New York specifically to avoid this conversation and hurting her best friend. As Lori walks away, book Joe is even worried Lori might kill himself. Timmy sells that level of misery as Joe goes home feeling as if she murdered some innocent thing and buried it under leaves. This is the best scene in the book and the movie, and it's earned by the constant investment in the pair's enigmatic relationship leading us here. There's so much hopeless romanticism for so many characters, love cuts deep and scars, and it hurts, something so accessible to so many. And if you're having trouble relating, you've never felt what Lori felt on that hill, or Joe in the attic, you just married your high school sweetheart and it's all been smooth sailing ever since, then fuck congratulations! And for the rest of us, grab a box of wine and put on this movie. This is one of the most beautiful scenes I've ever watched, and I couldn't be more disappointed in earlier versions of it. Beat for beat, line for line, Gerwig plays it closest to the book's 35th chapter titled Heartache. There's no non-consensual lip poaching or confinement to a close double of two faces sitting under a tree. And BBC, can we please get the budget for a single CGI tear from our dude here? The subtitles read sobs for 45 seconds, but you keep giving me close-ups where he's drier than the scones Joe fucks up in chapter 11. That one's called Joe Sucks at Baking, or something like that. Gerwig's dynamic adaptation rings true to the emotional dogfight that all got penned 150 years back. The flash forward coupled with the hill scene is just as amazing. If the hill scene is when Cap resolves to take on Thanos alone, the attic is the funeral scene after where Happy says he'll buy Morgan Stark cheeseburgers. You think you're done crying, but really you're about to cry more than ever. Joe's issue is so elaborate. It's brutal hearing her change of heart when I was just begging her to accept Lori in the previous sequence. I mean, she's backing a great feminist horse that runs laps all over this movie, but is stubborn to a fault. I agree women shouldn't need to marry a man to be something and are free to choose their own path, but the beauty of the freedom accompanying said choice is Joe March, you are free to be honest about your desire to be loved and vulnerable enough to give this man you've grown up with a chance. Dear God, it's Timothy freaking Chalamet, at least let him buy you coffee. <sighs> You're probably right, dating wasn't the same back then, and you can argue they've been getting coffee their whole life. But as I comb through this movie, I can't watch Lori stare so longingly at the back of Joe's head and not be rooting for these two to end up together. And I thought the clothes swapping was adorable too. Joe wears this vest here, this vest here, and I'm pretty sure this is Lori's scarf she has on the beach with Beth. Anyway, back to the attic. She is conflicted, bordering on denial, and a tired, mourning Joe lets all these feelings out in the attic to the mother of the century. It's like all these inner conflicts have swelled and burst at the same time. A broken Joe reneges on her defiant pledge of singleness to suddenly desire marriage. But it's not even that simple. 
She doesn't love anyone, she just doesn't want to be lonely. As a child, Jo was so sure of her plan to marry a pen, but after seeing life play out, she's grown to question it. She's lost the people closest to her to death, geography, or marriage, and is questioning if she's doing something wrong. As a hyper-nostalgic single guy who's had a lot of friends get married and move away, family pass, and just at a two-person Thanksgiving, I feel so much for Joe here and in one of her last conversations with Beth where she whimpers, I miss everything. This is a big moment for Joe March, who has stood so fearless and confident all movie long to finally be this vulnerable. Biggest chef's kiss to this performance. And we run through the tape with the romantic hurricane in this one. Watching Joe write her love confession to Lori while he's sucking the face of her sister across the ocean is just a notch below the stress I felt in Uncut Gems when KG was stuck in the vestibule. You taught me to love all three of these characters and now someone's gotta lose. It's brutal. But it's good writing. Until Professor X Machina comes along and solves all our problems or whatever. I love this movie because it so consistently defied my expectations and strayed from the obvious tracks of a romance story. Joe not getting with Lori, Lori getting with Amy, Beth surviving her illness only to die from the repercussions, Joe writing a confession of love to Lori only to have it go unread, Bob Odenkirk being in the movie, and Friedrich showing up to marry Joe just as soon as we've forgotten he exists. Now I know I'm part of the problem by mostly focusing on Joe and Amy, but like the screenwriters, I don't have time to give Meg and Beth the deep dives they deserve, but they're way better in the book, trust me. However, I can't end this video without giving at least a tip of the cap to my favorite March, Marmy. Which is shocking because she's actually the biggest of the little women. Marmy's the wise, loving cornerstone of the March family, whose presence Meg describes as so inexpressibly comfortable. But my favorite thing about her is that she never gets angry. I'm angry nearly every day of my life. Oh, that's right. None of these characters are one dimensional. 2019 was the first film adaptation to include this book line, which viewers might not expect from our mythical matronly angel. But showing some cracks in the perfect Marmy visage makes her position seem more attainable. And I'm sure Joe was remembering this conversation at the end of the film, when she swallows her heartache in true Marmy fashion for the sake of her sister. This scene really struck me, but the book goes even further with Marmy's suppressed frustrations mirroring Alcott's own mother's struggles. But I'm sure we all went through that phase of quarantine where we got really into Abigail Alcott's journals, so I'll just move on. Any final thoughts, Marmy? I hope you'll do a great deal better than me. I will do my best to make you proud. I've talked mostly about the women, but there are some incredible male characters as well. There's no bad boy, cool guy love interest, but rather a bunch of tender, caring, selfless male figures who don't shy away from showing emotion themselves. All the men befriend, encourage, challenge, and serve the titular ladies in ways that are admirable, even when they are met with resistance. Mr. Lawrence and Beth might be the most touching relationship in the film, especially after she's passed and he can't even bring himself to enter the home she once lived in unassisted. One Piece 2019 excludes is Lori visiting Amy every day while she's exiled to Aunt March's in order to avoid catching Beth's scarlet fever. I'm happy 1994 includes this sequence as it's one of the many book beats that makes the Lori Amy pairing feel less surprising. While I love this story so much, I simply must recommend the book because there is just so much more story to tell. If you've read the book, your low hanging criticisms are probably around the lack of time Gerwig was able to devote to. But that's just an unfortunate concession that comes with shoving a 740 page book into a movie. Your criticism is probably totally valid, but I really think Gerwig did the best she could. When looking at book movies, I think we should be critical of what they chose to include rather than if they were able to include everything, because that just won't happen. For instance, every Harry Potter movie is missing so much content from the books. 
but I expected that going in. I'm not upset because things were omitted, but I am disappointed with what certain movies, like Half-Blood Prince and Goblet of Fire, chose to focus on and change given their finite amount of runtime. While I wish we could fit everything from Little Women in this movie, that really isn't possible. I feel bad for Meg especially because she is so much more complex than in any film adaptation I saw and has this beautiful wrestling between head and heart where she's got a plan like Amy until the hunky tutor across the street shatters it into a million pieces. And then there's just so much fun little stuff. Like when Joe catches Fred Vaughn cheating in croquet, everyone else is just gonna let it slide, but then Joe just calls him out like the badass she is. We don't cheat in America, but you can if you'd like. Get dunked on, Fred Vaughn. Amy wasn't the first march to shut you down. Fred Vaughn is stable and well-mannered. And a fucking cheater. There are so many more themes and scenes I would love to break down. I could go on about Marmy for hours. But it's 2020, and people love ranking arbitrary stuff. So let's do that. Ranking the adaptations. 2019, 94, 33, 2017, the anime, 1949, 2018. Top five hair, Saoirse Ronan's Joe, Kirsten Dunst's Amy, the Lawrence men from 2019. Props to the casting because somebody definitely got his granddad's hair jeans. 2019 Marmy, Amy's paper dreads from the girls play in 33, and way at the bottom ranked negative a billion, Christian Bale's facial hair. We get it, there's a time jump. Top five hottest lorries. Number one, controversial, Jonah Hauer from the 2017 BBC series, Dark Horse, I know. Timothy Chalamet, Clean Shaven Bale, Anime Lori, and my friend Alec who played him in high school. Top five little women gifts I've been using over text, teams, and discord for the past year. Number one, Joe and Lori Nuzling. Two for two, Chalamet yes and Chalamet no. Amy saying, dress for festivities. Threw that one out a lot when replying to invites for Zoom Jackbox sessions. Number four, the porch dance. And number five, Joe pinning a mustache on Meg. This one is a bit more advanced than the others, the use a bit more nuanced. I use it as an intimate, aren't you cute, my shining star type thing. But it also works if you want to call someone out for being anti-Semitic. Top five sickest stunts. Number one, Katherine Hepburn with the sick grind down this railing in 33. Two, June Allison speed vaulting this fence and yeeting a white hot screamer of a snowball at her sisters. Three, Lori exploding out of the wardrobe dimension. Four, an uncredited balance beam performance from 1994. And she nails the dismount. Five, Marmy leaping off of the screen and into my heart forever. Yeah, woo! I love moms. And runner up to me practicing to reenact the Joe March on fire stunt, but lacking the courage to attempt it inside a house. Also, maybe the weakest joke in the film. You're on fire. Thank you. You're on fire! <laughs> Top five douchebags. Fred Vaughn, Fred Vaughn, Fred Vaughn, Fred Vaughn, and the Confederate general from the anime who breaks into the March household to look for an escaped slave, read, racist, and while he's in there sees Amy drawing and tells her she should find a new hobby. Not only is this sick because she's a child, but if we consider the fact that this is an anime, her drawings are actually hyper-realistic. Chase your dreams, Amy. And that guy can eat shit. With Fred Vaughn. Top five red carpet drip. I'm going Greta, LD, Eliza, Florence, and Emma. Not in love with the dress, but the earrings are doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. And you all look great. You're movie stars. What am I, wh wh why, why am I doing this? Wh what is this? What is my life? <laughs> now I'm a Marvel normie who had never heard of Greta Gerwig before I saw this movie, but I quickly tracked down everything she's ever been a part of afterward, and I have a few observations. If there's one thing she excels at, it's an ensemble. She's great at crafting a sense of community by bringing together a variety of characters that each feel amusing enough to warrant their own lead role. 
As an actor herself, she knows how to summon something special from her cast, whose interactions and relationships color the screen in athletic fashion. Her mumblecore roots lend to more natural sounding dialogue, producing seemingly organic humor. She writes writing that doesn't always sound like writing. When you pull the more grounded, almost awkward sounding style of dialogue from Lady Bird into a period piece, it makes it more approachable. If you enjoyed this movie and haven't checked out Gerwig's other work, do yourself a favor and look some up. Lady Bird, Frances Ha, and Mistress America all tell similar tales of ambitious young women with dreams ranging from admirable to naive trying to break out from the box they feel born trapped in. She puts her own life on the screen, with stories of Sacramento girls dreaming of bigger things in New York, even acting alongside her own family at times. Little Women may not have been as autobiographical, but Alcott's story is still a big part of Gerwig's. She credits it for inspiring her to get to where she is today saying, I feel this story in my marrow, and even calling it her own superhero origin story. As someone who gets really passionate about the things he likes, it makes me so happy to see creators throw their whole heart and brain and all the other organs on the page, and when I watch this movie, it's just bursting with passion. Watch an interview with any actor, they're all so enthusiastic and have some sort of personal connection to the work. Little Women was Gerwig's love letter to Alcott, and this is my love letter to her love letter. Little Women's impact on her is so visible in this movie and the other stories she's written about ambitious young women with lofty ideals that prove turbulent as they attempt to live them out. And they all seem to have a friend zone Lori type love interest. I'm just really impressed with Gerwig's adaptation after seeing the others that feel so antiquated in comparison. I figured Gerwig's being the modern take would have been the one to stray furthest from the source material, but I think Gerwig's is the closest to the book plot, and any plot beats she altered were informed by a detailed study of Alcott's life. Greta, you won me over with Little Women and Lady Bird. I am day one, butt in a seat, ready for whatever you make next. IMDB tells me that's Barbie, which I can only hope is a spiritual successor to the Disney Channel original movie Life Size, starring Tyra Banks. As the credits rolled, I can't help but think of the first scene where Laurie meets the March family. He walks into a chaotic swell of life and energy that leaves him silent. The camera pans from girl to girl in the March home. I think about the glimpses into their lives I've just been given. Laurie and I are both immediately intrigued and captivated by this house and the family occupying it. As I go to leave, I turn back, wishing I could stay. Know these women better. Live life with them but I settle for one last look at Joe March.